Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, Gloucester's 400th plus anniversary asked that I read the following. The city of Gloucester is located on traditional and ancestral homeland of the Pawtucket people and their neighbors, the Massachusetts, the Nipmuc, and the Pentecost and the Wampanoag tribes. The original Angonquin name for this land is Agawam, potentially meaning fish curing place. We recognize and honor the native and indigenous peoples who have lived in this territory for more than 10,000 years, are here now, and will be here for generations to come. We acknowledge our responsibility to include native people and perspectives across our efforts to share Gloucester's history. During Gloucester's 400th plus anniversary, and looking towards the future, we seek to expand the visibility and celebrate the histories, cultures, and stories of the native and indigenous peoples of this place. This Baylor Society event features the work of five of Gloucester's principal writers. Peter Nassus, Jonathan Bayless, Vincent Farini, Joe Garland, and Charles Olson. Touching upon particular sections of the city, Rocky Neck, the Fort, the Cut, Stagefoot Park, Governor's Hill, and Lane's Cove. Our surroundings flavor so much of our personal aspect. Some places we know through hands-on intimacy, others through impressions built up over the years. The various sections of Gloucester detailed by these writers, each has its own feel, and each place is seen through the writer's own lens. We have five presenters. Benjamin Anastas. Ben is the author of three novels and a memoir. Other work has appeared in The New Yorker, Oxford American, Hoppers, and the Paris Review. Mary John Boylan. Mary John is currently a member of Gloucester's Affordable Housing Trust and the board of directors of the Gloucester Stage Company. The author of three plays so far, she is nevertheless keeping her day job as a trial attorney and special assistant attorney general. Henry Farini. In 1977, when Jonathan Bayless worked in the mayor's office in Gloucester, he hired a 24-year-old Henry Farini to be the media director of the newly formed Gloucester Arts and Humanities Council. This job resulted in a way to pay the rent as well as create a short nonfiction video called The Light, The Quality, The Time, The Place. Since then, he has been making documentary films. His new documentary is on the great tenor saxophonist Lester Young. Ken Riaf lives in Gloucester. In the 70s and 80s, he unloaded boats on the state fish beer and fished commercially with Captain Bill Sibley and Captain Tom Morse. He practices law and is a visiting lecturer at Endicott College. Ben Wildrick. Ben has lived in Gloucester for the, post, the past 24 years. He is an elementary school science teacher with a secret past in the performing arts. In his sparse spare time, Ben likes to make things. We begin here on Rocky Neck, a busy neighborhood sited on a splayed fist of land tucked within Gloucester Harbor. Rocky Neck separates the sheltered confines of the inner harbor from the wider expanses of the outer harbor leading to the breakwater and the sea beyond. We start with Ken Ria. Thanks, George. Good evening. I'm reading from uh, Joseph Garland's Gloucester Guide about Rocky Neck. No one knows when the causeway to Rocky Neck was raised above the tide, but it must have been no later than the 1840s when it was Peter Mudd's Neck. In the 1600s, you had to get there across the bar at low water. 
Uh, today, there's a public park on the Outer Harbor side of the bar and a parking lot above Smith's Cove in the busy season. It's a good idea to leave your car there and cross the neck on foot, as Mr. Mudd did. This isolated sheep pasture of yours is now jammed with homes, narrow and winding streets, art studios and galleries, gift shops, marinas, and restaurants, and precious little street rooms. Yet this quasi-island retains its oldest industry, the colorful and rough-hewn marine railways at the end of Rocky Neck Avenue, which from 1859 until about 1970 employed a steam engine to haul up fishing vessels for painting and repairs. The landmark marine anti-fouling copper paint manufactory of Tar and Wanson built at the next western tip in 1863, ceased operations in the early 1980s. For years, the 1851 bell from the former Point Grammar School on Plum Street struck the hour from the copper paint until it was moved again to the roof of the present TD Bank across on Rogers Street. The paint factory buildings now house Ocean Alliance, a nonprofit whose mission is to increase public awareness of the importance of whale and ocean health through research and public education. The site is being carefully restored and rebuilt to maintain its historical character. In 1859, the Neck had a population of 143 and was mainly a sheep pasture, but in the years after the Civil War, its Smith's Cove shore came to rival the East Gloucester side as every running foot of protected deep water wharfage was pressed into the surface of an expanding fleet. The relics of that area, excuse me, that era, thick with the smell of ash and salt, have long since been converted to the uses of the artist, the summer boarder, and the tourist a trend that began with the discovery of the next quaint beauty by such painters as Walter Dean, A.W. Bueller, Theodore Victor Vallenkamp, Frank Denuvec, Child Hassam, John Sloan, John Henry Twachman, Charles Groupie, Frederick Malhup, and their friends and followers. I'm going to read an excerpt from uh, a column that my father wrote called The Whole Town Seemed Different. It's in a walker in the city. There's a reference to our store, the family store, which uh, was uh, a luncheonette and grocery store called Peter's, now Sailor's Stands. Gloucester Daily Times, September 3rd, 1980. After we moved from the cut to Rocky Neck in 1951, Labor Day was a more dramatic event. The number of customers in our store and all the shops and restaurants on Rocky Neck would decrease markedly. You could tell the difference the day after Labor Day. The Neck would literally be deserted. Slowly all Dad's regulars, Richard Hunt, Stan Farrell, Tommy Morris, Bill Sibley, Joe Garland, Jerry Hill, Harry Wheeler, Walter Kidder, uh, Parker Morong, would reappear to take up their old stools at the counter for those long fall and winter nights of coffee and talk. Come winter, Dad closed early, and we actually got a chance to sit down and talk together as a family before my brother and I went to bed early on school nights. Summer ended precipitously in East Gloucester. One day you'd be walking past the Hawthorne Inn Casino, the deli thronged with bathers from Niles Beach, Johnny Windhurst and his Dixieland band screaming away upstairs at night with us kids on the back porch, taking in the music breathlessly. And the next day it seemed the casino would be empty, boarded up like the rest of the cottages, silent. And with the sharp winds of coming September nights, the whole place would take on a forlorn air, the Rockaway Hotel and the Harbor View, the Delphine and the Hawthorne Inn, the Fairview and the Seacroft Hotel, all closed for the season, as the signs on them would read when we walked past them on those chilly nights after Labor Day, to discover that summer had indeed gone, disappeared just like that, and all of us here somehow left holding the bag. So from Joe Garland's uh, Beating to Windward. It's called Up from the Sea on Sib's Hand Crank Marine Railway. Spring fitting out time is here, and that means gearing up 
Captain Charles William Sibley's hand crank narrow gauge marine railway, unincorporated, the smallest of the three on Rocky Neck. Well, it was hand cranked up until about six years ago. Before that, it was automated, that is, mated with an auto. <laughs> the Sibleys own an ample double house on the harbor side and a studio on the Smith Cove side of the road at the west end of the causeway that connects the continent of Rocky Neck with the island of Gloucester. Now and then, someone wants to know why I don't write a book about the man. It's simple. I wouldn't have him suspect there was anything more ulterior in my friendship than using his railway and workshop, borrowing his tools, taking advantage of his boat carpenting expertise, picking his brain for Gloucester waterfront law, and passing on an occasional sibleyism to a reader. Bill bought a sturdy, old-time sailboat that father and son converted into a 40-foot-odd fishing dragger Peggy Bell and signed on Tommy Morse, a compact young guy from over in East Gloucester Square uh, who never wanted to do anything but go fishing. And the question inevitably arose, instead of grounding her out on the flats against the studio pilings for working on down in the mud in the low water, why not build a little railway to haul her up on high and dry all tides of the day and night? This is from Jonathan Bayless's Gloucester Tide, the chapter Norman Maroon. Despite the aborted attempt to accompany Watt at work he lived for, Rafe was, a, was glad that at least he'd been introduced to the solid breakfasts at Spartans. The lunchroom, situated on a V where the principal streets of the neck divaricated from the main stem of the causeway, was no more than a cable length from his own underused kitchen and only across a narrow one-way street from Argo Cove on, on the inner harbor side where Watt received visitors in the atelier next to his private little marine railway. At the lunchroom, they had found five or six working landsmen, three of whom from a city truck parked hard by merely smiled when Watt hailed them sotto voce as the DPW's cruising crew of crafty work, work dodgers who Rafe understood made up the regular weekday gathering that waited for the unfailing proprietor to unlock the door exactly on time, long before the, neck, the rest of the neck was disturbed by sunlight breaking over the trees on the foreside ridge. Mr. Spartan never took a day off, and in the summer he was busy late into the evening. The other clients nodded to Watt and exchanged almost soundless formulas worn down to esoteric signals by decades of familiarity with each other's sight. But in their embarrassment at a new man's presence, Rafe was democratically ignored. Dressed like a rusticating exotic, but perhaps one of the marine biologists Sibber occasionally took under his wing. In any case, they could see at a glance too innocent looking to merit, merit serious suspicion. Watt's professional friends, a few Yankee day trippers who tied up at East Harbor, were already outside the breakwater with their acolytes in larger boats than his. On one of Rocky Neck's finger, on one of Rocky Neck's fingers, stands what can be described as Gloucester's Colossus of Roads, or motif number one, a structure known locally as the Copper Paint Factory. It is from the Copper Paint Factory we now depart Rocky Neck and cross the narrow stretch of harbor that runs between it and Gloucester proper, to an area in the city called the Fort. The Fort, where neighbors in their apartments reside cheek by jowl with each other, with fish, fish processing plants, and with the Grand Beauport Hotel. This is also from Joe Garland's The Gloucester Guide, The Waterfront. Fort Point and Rocky Neck are the gateway to Gloucester's protected inner harbor. The fort was called Watch House Neck during the Revolution for earthwork thrown up on the height by the local patriots. The town ceded it to the United States in 1794. It was reactivated during the War of 1812 as Fort Defiance went to ruins and was brought back to life for the last time in the Civil War with two batteries of naval guns. 
Down Commercial Street on the right are the Cape Ann Chamber of Commerce and its information center in the building of the former Cape Ann Manufacturing Company, which many years ago parlayed fishermen's oil skins into the well-known sportswear label Mighty Mac. Cunningham and Thompson dominated the fisheries at the fort, held out against the big four that coalesced into Gorton Pew and built the plant formally on the right of Commercial Street above the beach acquired in the 1920s by Clarence Birdseye. Here with his Birdseye division of General Foods, his modest, no-nonsense man conducted the quick freeze experiments that would revolutionize not only Gloucester fishing, but for the entire food industry. Here on their wooden flakes above the beach, the men of Gloucester dried their catch for nigh 300 years before this plant put an end to salt fish. And here on this beach, Captain Lindsay's men tried to set fire to those flakes and the town that day of August 1775, and they were captured by our Minutemen before they could do either. Clockwise around Fort Square, we've come to the lot of the former Cape Ann Fisheries Wharf and plant burnt in 1970, where the casual weekend pollockers dropped their hooks for the casual pollock. Forty million pounds of fresh fish went through this plant in the war year of 1943 alone. German U-boats be damned. Today, nothing remains but the view. From the high ground of the fort, we see how it commanded the harbor and can still discern the earthworks on the steep side toward the city. Down the slope at 28 Fort Square lived Charles Olson, Gloucester's mountainously unofficial poet laureate after T.S. Eliot. A bear of a man at six feet eight, Olson, who died in 1970 at 59, was the bard of the beat generation, author of the Maximus poems, scholar, and passionate lover of Gloucester. From Charles Olson's Maximus poems, Sunday, January 16th, 1966. Golden life, golden light on Western Harbor, out my west window, at least 35 minutes after sunset, and brightest silver nearest me, just over the edge of the playground. Glow dying by 5.20 p.m., 40 minutes after sunset. Light in house now almost reduced so I cannot see to write. Evening then is at the most 40 minutes long. This is from Peter Ness's column, uh, Never Sell at the Waterfront. As a child, I learned to know the waterfront on Saturday and Sunday morning walks with my grandfather. Through all the seasons, he would take my brother and me down to the fort to watch the fishing boats being unloaded at the old Cape Ann Fisheries Wharf. I got to recognize the boats by name, and the sound of Sicilian being spoken became as much a part of my life as the Greek I heard at home. I remember the slick of wet ash scales on the greasy planks of the wharfs along Commercial Street and below Fort Square. I can hear, I can still hear the screech of the winches, feel the heft of those immense baskets of cod and haddock. I can see the men in oilskins and hip boots up to their waists in the fish and the ice of the holds. And always I recall the smell of the fish from the boats and the gurry on the belts of the cutting and packing line. I never went fishing, although I always wanted to. But I worked on fish in high school and college and many of independent plants and later at Gorton's. I shoveled it, I packed it. I worked on fish meal in the flake rooms and on the wharves and I loaded it into boxcars at the railroad station. I am going to read a poem from Vincent's collection uh, of poems. It's a long series called No Fish, and that is K-N-O-W, not N-O. And he did a bunch of these poems in the dialect. 
So I'm going to try to replicate it. It's called Fort Defiance. Is the same, please no change. Strangers, come, stay. No go through this ocean grange. For us, this is home and tutti. Once was Irish Frenchy, then Italian, now potato salad, pasta fazool and clench. The bambini boats and the fish plants under the windows of these elevations. These rich poor don't a sell one inch or a foot. Have Pubjik public and 14 stations. Overhead is the axe and the deadlines of urban bulldozer and the oily dollar. The shadow of condo is punch drunk in their tink tanks and stuck there can a swallow. So is one day or a year a mamaduke? See the faces of the boats, souls of oysters, Drift in tides, wash and renew the faith of these tenements of Catholic cloisters. More Gloucester is this palisades, poorer than an immigrant and a hippie. An anarchy replanting a rapscallion English. Go like cat, be rocky, go flippery. Vincent includes in this a quote from Olson's Maximus, and he says, This town works at dawn because fishermen do. It makes, therefore, a very different city, a hippocampus of a city, half fish set and half fish land, and day is riverine when men are washed as gods in the basin of mourning. We now make our way out of the fort's warren and journey further along the harbor to the spot where its water's tidal surge race through the man-made defile aptly called the Cut. Until the building of Route 128 in the 1950s, all road traffic into Gloucester had to pass over the cut on a bridge which opens regularly to allow vessels to pass through. This feature continues to bedevil motorists today. It's uh, Joe Garland. There's an excitement about the London Canal, which we call the Cut. Go there day or night any season, when an easterly slashes rain across and whips up spray from the surf smashing on the seawall, or when the June sun sparkles on the harbor and casts the blossoms on the ebb for the souls of the men who went down to the sea and did not return, or in the fullness of the evening, when the rising moon profiles Eastern Point and she diamonds on the water. The red lights flash on, the sirens scream, the gates swing across the boulevard, gears grind, and the jaws of the drawbridge crack open to let a fishing dragger or a pleasure boat through. For a few minutes, Gloucester is almost an island. Then the jaws descend and shut with a toothsome click the gates swing clear, and the line of summer traffic drones across again, always with that urgency, can we make it before the next boat shuts us <laughs> off? <laughs> Especially before Route 128 spanned the river in 1953, the cut bridge has symbolized Gloucester's isolation and contrariness. Since 1907, when the state dredged the channel and rebuilt and electrified the bridge, the machinery has waited as if it had a life of its own to get stuck halfway up or down on a sunny summer Sunday afternoons, each time requiring a citywide search for Sylvester Deering, the only electrician 
in town who talked its language. Before that, uh, back to just after the Civil War, when the canal was reopened, the bridge was cranked and swung by hand, and some local magician with a different bag of tricks had to conjure with it. This is from Prologue, A Map of the Neighborhood from my father's memoir, Epitaph. Someone found a pencil under the newsstand on the plywood floor. We began not only to draw what we wanted to on any particular day, we also started to make a map of our entire neighborhood with us in it. It was an easy thing to achieve this map. The block of houses which constituted our neighborhood was bounded on one side by Perkins Road and on the other by Centennial Avenue, both of which ran perpendicular to the boulevard, which was properly called Western Avenue. Perkins Road curved around to the right, abutting Newell Stadium and joining Centennial Avenue, thereby, tying neat, uh, thereby neatly tying the block off from a strip of land that ran along the Blindman Canal all the way down to Gloucester High School to the left of Perkins Road and the houses on the right of Centennial Avenue that were part of yet another discrete neighborhood that fronted on the boulevard. Beginning with Elise Cutler's flower shop on the corner of the boulevard and Perkins Road, we drew in all the houses, putting the initials of the people who lived in them in the center of the squares that indicated the houses. We brought crayons and colored pencils into our hideout and colored the squares the same colors as the houses. We put green in the spaces between the houses to indicate grass. Sometimes we even drew in the gardens that bordered them. Next, we sketched the drawbridge that spanned the canal linking the island of Cape Ann to the mainland. The longer we worked on the map, the more details we added, and the more we spread out to include the stadium, its baseball and football fields, and a promontory of immense granite outcroppings above Centennial Avenue that overlooked the entire neighborhood. People called that Rider's Rock. Even though the space under the newsstand was restricted, there was still enough room in it for at least three of us as we worked on the map together, getting in the blue of the outer harbor, 10-pound island that loomed in the middle of it, with its white and black lighthouse and keeper's cottage, and the breakwater beyond. This is one from uh, Vincent's book, uh, The Community of Self, called Inside the Cut. The blue-green meditations of your channel, who is not inside it dreaming? In the white hours of the whirlwind of tor turns, fluttering high and diving for currents. Both sides of your thighs balancing my unseen ghost. Your vitamin marshes and inlets of plentitudes. The shoals of your wayward pauses and the night thoughts fishing. The whole of you is, part from the, is apart from the continent and the beloved of the landlocked, split of the two hemispheres, the dancing X overtaking personality, an unminding man-made hymen for bounty boats and the uptight traffic. Through the three Though the three bridges bind you to commerce, anti-self-seductions are your nemesis. Independence is your habit and carefree airs. The light of your mood of your moods is a scarf around us. Moonrise is your eye over passing times and the lookouts go for the sunsets. You break the nights and swirls of wandering because you divide and unite at once. And trying, tying the morning with the news of the loving, we are only at the edge of. This is from Jonathan Bayless's Gloucester book, the chapter Rafe's Log. As you know, however, nothing can dampen my zeal for exploring any place that's new to me, not even a dismal ceiling of high gray clouds. After breakfast, I set out westward on Front Street, the most promising way to escape the downtown jumble on foot. My purpose was to skirt the northern strand of the outer harbor and try the broadest view from Salt Cod Park. 
When I crossed the harbor end of the Janus brine-washed Namash on the double bascule bridge at the center of the esplanade, where the river narrows into a short granite-lined canal to pierce the seawall, I saw that Dogtown's principal part may have been made into an island artificially. The cut that makes it such, severing what looks like a natural connection to the city's mainland reaches, is trafficked with fishing boats on the way to and from inshore grounds, labeled Smith's Bay, north of the Cape. And I suppose that before Labor Day, it's clogged with pleasure cruisers. I was glad to see a public institution that still gives right of way to things that float. It's an issue you can appreciate when you see the long lines of cars that form quickly on either side when the bridge's two skew jaws are open. The bridge tender told me that he's opened for boats as many as 49 times in a single shift in July. By ignoring the dilapidation of masonry and set in living granite, beer cans in the shrubbery, broken glass in the glades, paper scattered everywhere and discarded condoms in the nooks, even a stranger as hostile as Miles Standish would see that the grounds of the park were once admirable. You try to imagine the fresh thrill of that prominence when it was a hillside meadow footed by those bare knobs of massive rock, smoothed by millennia of weather, but plasmatically articulated with the continent's foundation, which still guard the crescent horns of a tiny, dilatescent beach like miniature double Gibraltars. From the lowest oak-dressed ledge of one of those sun-bleached chthonic exposures, I walked the eroded earthworks of a small, small iron cannon fort that reaches unpretentiously into the harbor. Still traversing the water's edge and assuming the cut bridge is not raised up, we now go around a bend in the shore to Stagefort Park which is rich in Gloucester history. This site was the nexus of the efforts of the original seafaring Gloucestermen. The stage they erected here was a fish drying platform. And later, in revolutionary times, when bracing for attacks from sea, cannon were placed here. Garland, again, from the guide. At Stage Fort Park, climb the twisting path up the stone steps to the highest elevation of Tablet Rock, the whaleback of granite that marks the first settlement of the Massachusetts Bay Colony at this spot in 1623, and drink in the glorious view of Gloucester and its harbor. And what a harbor and what a history. There is the Atlantic to the south, to the west of that, the North Shore, Eastern Point directly across, Ten Pound Island, and the Old City to the northeast. John Mason was making the first proper survey of the waterfront one autumn day when he dropped everything to take count and ink it on his map, 1833, 14 October, 443 vessels at anchor in the harbor besides what lay at the wharfs. That was 210 years after the 14 men of the Dorchester Company landed at our feet here from England to see if this fabled new world they'd heard such tales of would support a fishing and farming expedition. Look at the forested hills of West Gloucester behind you and the rocks all around and the pitiful soil of Fisherman's Field and then back at this harbor and you'll know in a flash how matters develop that John Mason counted 443 vessels out there and why those 14 failed and why one of the organizers back in England, John White, would write it off thus. First, that no sure fishing place in the land is fit for planting, nor any good place for planting found fit for fishing at least near the shore, and secondly, rarely, any fisherman will work at land, neither are husbandmen fit for fishermen, but with long use and experience. Again, Charles Olson, of course, the Maximus Plains. Stage Fort Park. 
The Algonquins had cleared the land there, Champlain shows, stage fort as containing five wigwams with crops. It was the first place the English as fishermen West countrymen used to settle on, importing the large company house in which the original 14 men lived. The first stage was built there. It was divided among 17 men in 1642 as what they were, fishermen's field, and the Parsonses made it their village or homestead from shortly thereafter until my father's time and mine, then it was Barrett's, so far as we were originally concerned, he building his first summer camps about the time he was mayor of Gloucester, 1914, on the model of his sister Lizzie Corliss's hen house. In fact, the first one was a hen house, the one the bed broke down under my mother and father the first night we came to Gloucester, slept in, and with the rain which I had seen out Johnny Morgan's candy kitchen window the afternoon previous, continuing through the night, my mother had had a lot of Gloucester already and never ceased remembering. We shifted around thereafter, were up on Bond Street with Bill Collins, the letter carrier, another summer, and at the Morse's the next, and for some summers had the Gambrell, the old schoolhouse of the cut, which Ed Millett has now had for years, but my father was always planning to get back up on the front. And when the big camp was maybe first built, we had it from then on forever, fronting out on the park exactly at the stone wall line of what was probably always a certain division of fishermen's field, that the edge of the cultivatable or usable sun and air edge for salting and drying fish was that line which goes in angles with some strictness from the cupboard to the low spot of Western Avenue opposite the marsh, the old stream, which now backs down the new houses on the marsh side and is a mess where the Strongs kept horses since they were Cressies and tar trucks and broken down road equipment were since Homer was also later superintendent of streets for years. And Roland had the oil and hop top contract and the two brothers owned the American Oil Company, courted the two beauties of the camps and one walked away with the darker. The brook coming out of the forest at just about Bond Street at one mile from the city flowed then by John Parsons' orchard and, well, made James Parsons' house a dell. See Bertha Cressy's mother's painting of the old Cressy homestead just there. And Jeffrey, the original wampum of the tribe, the buck and founder, his house which George Ingersoll had owned, and before him, George Norton, another ship's carpenter had built, the first house settler after the Algon Algonquins and the Dorchester Company house, which was probably up in the field over Settlement Cove like a fortress, or Christopher Levitt's at Portland, on an island to have room around it and sight in an enemy country on shore. This is a precy of land I am shod in, my father's shoes. We now turn our attention to the interior of the city, to the hills underlain with granite formed by the glaciers. The Crockett Governor's Hill sits atop one of the highest of these. I don't know for which governor it's named. In fact, it's one of the least known parks in the city. It's always seemed to me to be a bit of a secret place for those in the neighborhood. from City of Hills uh, in my father's book, A Walker in the City, which uh, should be in your gift bag if you've registered for the conference. Don't think that because we were young, we didn't want to observe the world from any height or angle available to us. There were no distracting TVs in the 1940s. And radio, while it may have kindled our imaginations, who wouldn't have been excited by the shadow, didn't disnify our perceptions. 
No, we were noticers, we kids who lived at the cut or down on Babson Court and along Mansfield Street. From the boulevard, we watched the endless stream of fishing vessels and pleasure boats as they negotiated the Blindman Canal. We were curious also to see the tourists who began to stream back into the city after the war, the women in flamboyant straw hats and the men in plaid shorts, which no native would appear dead in on Main Street. If you wanted to avoid the quintessential expression of Gloucester derision, down for the summer. <laughs> but it's the hills I've had in my mind ever since I recently walked up to Governor's Park. Dusk was approaching, that magical hush as the day ends and the night has not quite declared itself. I stood listening to the muted sounds of the city, the voices of kids playing after supper, the barking of dogs, the muffled roar of automobile engines. Robins sang, swallows darted in the muggy air, and beneath me the city spread out from East Gloucester and the paint factory to Ravenswood. Where else would one ever want to be? What else would one want to do on such a summer night but stand and take it all in? There was the familiar roof of the Hovey School, now condos, the assorted 19th and 20th century houses of Beacon Hill just below Commonwealth Avenue where I stood, and the harbor itself spotted with small craft heading for their moorings as night began to fall. It was here on Governor's Hill and the big Victorian house to the right as you face the park that I was taken one Sunday morning during the war by our neighbor, Gardner Deering. Gardner was an air raid warden, and at the top of that house, in its attic or under an enclosed widow's walk, was a lookout station. Surrounded by windows, the men who were there on duty, Coast Guardsmen or Civil Defense volunteers like Gardner, watched for signs of strange aircraft or German submarines. I remember maps strewn about and a short wave radio. I couldn't have been more than six years old when I climbed the dark, echoing stairway to the top of the house, but I've never forgotten the view out across the city and the harbor. I remember the men patiently explaining to me what their mission was, for German subs had been sighted off Thatcher's Light in the Isle of Shoals, and I later learned that spies speaking perfect English had come ashore in South Portland, where they were apprehended by the Coast Guard. This is from Jonathan Bayless's Gloucester book, uh, the chapter Beltane Hill. He was taking her to survey the harbor from his favorite vantage, the climax of their loop back to Cod Street. Luckily, they found no children to disturb his pleasure in the neglected little park, a plot of jagged, striated gray rock reaching for the sky with knobby fins and arched vertebrae, scantily awash in thin swells of desiccated winter grass. Few traces of former public investment shared the crown of Beltane Hill with a large private house situated at the peak of its naked earth bone, the spacious square cupola of which, an observatory 20 feet above the harbor's highest geodetic point, Caleb coveted as much as any Irish tower with a winding stair. Other neat or tattered houses, for the most part likewise white, supported a rooftop field of old flues and new antennas that crowded the plunging trapezoid, uh, uh, plunging trapezoid boundaries of the deserted little park below their vantage. Discreet, undisturbing shouts of young distant ones, distant young ones rose up to them among all the blended noises of the city, softened and purified by the filter of habitation. From this nexus of earth and welkin, now in taut, pale sunshine, bracing their feet on pinnacles of granite, they beheld through disparate eyes the clear, cold city and the windless seas. From here, at least, you can still see both the bays, Caleb pointed out, and the ocean to the east as well. And he insisted that she look behind the house at the Marsh River Basin with the wooded hills beyond the marshes. But she preferred to gaze at the outer harbor, obscured only by the clutter of its margins, spread out before them like a dreamt-up lagoon, separated from the limitless waters by the long arm of the foreside with its baton of breakwater posed, poised on the surface of the blue. <laughs> the forlorn boats abroad on the map of the offing seemed as motionless as differentiated dots of paint 
and those underway inside the harbor move no more perceptibly than the minute hands of an electric clock. The sublimity of the prospect didn't prevent him from jabbering about its nearer, homely features as if it was her duty as a journalist to take note of what even natives hadn't been taught to see. The welter of asphalted wooden gables with white or sometimes green or yellow pediments, even pink, each facing the way it pleased, though jostled by higher and lower roofs pitched every which way, such that many of the unseen streets must have been crimped and twisted to reach them. The brick powerhouse and its stack, the colossal brick armory with a red compass needle shingled up on top to guide airplanes, migratory birds and monarch butterflies, the state fish pier and its massive freezer, likewise brick, a half-abandoned factory of lofty, fenestrated brick rising like a flat cathedral barracks above its gray wooden neighborhood, and warehouses mostly of old, of old wood lining the waterfront in both directions from the new brick fish factory of Mercator Steel Yard. He thought chimneys should interest her more than steeples, which, however, were what she asked about, starting with the Victorian Baroque clock tower of Ibis City Hall, which dominated the massed architecture of the Acropolis, even when viewed from above. He also made her listen to the approaching whistle of a train as the inland signal of liturgical hours that day and night regularly outsounded the unceasing pulsations of the inner harbor. Our last location takes us to the back of the Cape, the back of the Cape, you'll see it on the map, to Lane's Cove, a tiny refuge carved in indentation along that rocky coast. Quarrying was the enterprise here, in the Finns who came to work in these deep, square-sided holes brought their activist politics with them, which sentiments have yet persevered in Lanesville. to guide Lanesville to Enniswan. Lanesville sprawls along the granite from here to the south shore of Plum Cove, but its heart is its harbor, Lanes Cove, which was Flagstone Cove until soon after John Lane settled there in 1704. Day fishing in Ipswich Bay remains Lanesville's oldest industry. Its richest, however, fished chunks of granite from the depths of the ledge. Quarrying lasted only 75 years, not because the supply gave out, but because asphalt and concrete replaced paving blocks and building stone around World War I. The landscape has healed its wounds quite cosmetically, as we shall see by choosing the left fork and keeping on Washington Street instead of rising with Route 127 and Langsford Street. Uh, close, close on our left are uh, what first appear to be twin ponds, another look reveals water-filled quarry pits, the preserve of the late sculptor Paul Manship, whose house and studio, as viewed from around the corner on Leverett Street, sit astride them. The easterly of the two pits is said to be 85 feet deep. Washington Street is the old main road of Lanesville Village, here, a quiet avenue of time-worn and dignified clabbered houses. Cut granite is everywhere, foundations, walls, gate posts, though few houses are made of it from the ground up. Anywhere on Cape Ann, it's too expensive. Rejoining Langsford Street laid out later, after the first quarries were opened, we take a sharp right and left down the grade by where a popular sauna uh, once was uh, steamed, uh, Lanesville steamed with saunas in the days of the Finnish stonecutters colony and come out at Lanes Cove, the smallest harbor on the coast. It was created by a private company organized to build the breakwater in the early 1830s when Quincy men were blasting out the first commercial quarries on Cape Ann. The city bought out the company's rights to the cove in the 1960s and made a public landing of it with ramp, float, and parking. Lane's Cove was as much a harbor for the shore fishermen as it 
for the stone sloops and coasting schooners. Father to son stowed tub trawl trubs, bait boxes, nets, floats, jigging lines, and lobster gear in a shanty town of fish shacks, here and rowed or sailed, weary or dory, generally single-handed as far out as six or eight miles into the bay for a day of fishing. Nor was it unusual for a man to labor back at dusk with a ton of codfish setting him down almost to his gunnels. The flat stone ledge that first identified the cove makes a wading pool of it today. The heavy rusted rings and chains, the cylindrical glanard, uh, granite bollards for spring lining, the vessels to the piers, vestiges of the derricks are all still here. Small boats have hauled up since colonial times at the end of the marsh where the stream meets the sea and the purple loose strife grows. Vincent characterized Lanesville in a poem he wrote called Extreme Parish. A heartland by the seashore, granite heads and wheat skin, don't hobnob on me. As in the silence, the nerves roar. O oh, barracks cove of dinky shelter, ooze quarries, lap the dairy folk, and slate lichen feed the foreigners. Prizes are on the rape as the taxpayers swelter. This village on the wave of a leaf is Van Gogh brushstrokes in the rich of no money. Volcano stars burst. Moon jewels in the streets of reef. The labor of beginnings and cracked testifiers read stone perfumes. Thistles overhead of radicals have infinite patience, for the worms are organizing the dead. Fins, fools, fawns, and fairies, under cover of doom drum their festivals. The messages go backyard to ruts employed by the devil of the wizard Marys. It is at the village post office you get the dirt the queer news, and the connection dope. See once only and never meet again. Hear a sunstroke for the wise and wet. I'm going to read a little piece here, which is actually the end of Vincent's autobiography, which I think will resonate with uh, pretty much everyone who, uh, who lives here. Um, it's from his autobiography, uh, Herman in the Clouds, and it closes with, Every inch of this island is holy. I wake up with it, we work with it, sleep with it, dream with it, loving every inch and the peace and the whole at once. What cannot be taken away, the temple outside me, in me, I am inside of, life is the poem. <laughs>